meeting to order. We get to have the roll call, please. Andre Spinelli. Here. Jared Gardner. Here. Radhika Krishna. Here. Jim Winchester. Here. Scott Pullis. Here. Brandy Eber. Here. Daniel George. Here. Greg Strike. Here. Jeff Ron will be calling in at about 7.30. Thank you. Have a quorum. The first item is the minutes from Monday, November 6th and Thursday, November 16th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Moved by Commissioner Polis, seconded by Commissioner Eber. Any corrections, objections, or comments on the minutes? Hearing none, those minutes are approved. M moving on to disclosures. Are there any disclosures from the commission? I was absent from the November meetings. I will abstain from participating in the consent agenda. Just for clarification, the minutes that, uh, of the special meeting, uh, I was not able to attend the special meeting. You can still participate. Additional disclosures? You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, something that would prevent me from consideration, but I know we're taking up uh, multifamily uh, questions that I own, a triplex and a fourplex here in Anchorage, for what it's worth. And I think you can participate. Commissioner Strike, do you have anything to disclose? No, no disclosures. You do. I believe you need to abstain from the consent agenda. I'm looking here now. Stand corrected then. I will remove myself from the consent agenda discussion. Perfect. Thank you. And I will abstain from Resolution 2023-017. I was recused from that case. And I will be recusing myself from 2023-0130 and 2023-0131. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Moved by Commissioner Eber, seconded by Commissioner Gardner. Anyone wishing to pull any items from the consent agenda for discussion? Seeing none, hearing none, are there any objections to the approval of the consent agenda? Hearing none, consent agenda is approved. Um, we will now move on to the public hearings, and I will read the process for which the public may testify. I'm sorry, first, can we have a motion to combine Case 2023-0130 and 2023-0131. I move to combine public hearing items G2-2023-0130 and G3-2023-0131. Any discussion? Hearing none, any objection? The agenda, the combining those cases is approved. <laughs> All right. 
Now I will read the procedures by which the public may speak to the Commission at this meeting. After staff presentation is completed on public hearing items, the Chair will ask for public testimony on the issues. Persons who wish to testify will follow the time limits established in the Commission rules in procedure of procedure. Petitioner, including his or her representatives, will receive 10 minutes. Part of this time may be reserved for rebuttal. Representatives of groups, community councils, PTAs, etc. will receive five minutes and individuals will receive three minutes. When your testimony is complete, you may be asked questions by the Commission. You may only testify once on any issue unless questioned by the Commission. Any party of interest wishing to appeal shall first file with the planning director within seven days of the Commission's decision made on record a written notice of intent to appeal in accordance with AMC 2103-050-A4A. Commission recommendations to the Anchorage Assembly are not appealable. Following approval of the written findings of fact and decision, any party of interest may within 20 days file an appeal by filing a notice of appeal and paying the appeal fee and deposit in accordance with section 2103050. The notice of appeal must be filed with the planning director on a form prescribed by the municipality. If the appellant, appellant is not the applicant, the appellant notice of appeal shall include proof of service on the applicant. Okay, we will now move to case 2023-0129. Can we please have staff's presentation? Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a conditional use application for commercial food production in the B3 General Business District. Commercial food production was permitted in the old zoning code, but a conditional use permit is required in the current zoning code. The site has a de facto conditional use permit for the 31,445 square foot warehouse or wholesale distribution since it was established under the old zoning code. Domino's Pizza is requesting conditional use approval for commercial food production for this existing commercial structure. This structure will, re will require internal tenant improvements and two dock ramps to serve the existing overhead doors on the east side of the facility. These construction improvements will be handled through the building permit process once these improvements are completed, this facility will help Domino's meet the demand for its growing dough production. It is unable to do so at its current smaller location on King Street. A pre-application conference was held on September 26, 2023 in accordance with AMC 2103080C2. A community council meeting was held with the Taku Campbell Community Council on September 14, 2023 in accordance with AMC 2103080C3. 141 public hearing notices were mailed on November 7th, 2023. No responses were received from the public and the Taku Campbell Community Council did not provide comments. There were no objections under municipal reviewing agencies uh, to the conditional use for commercial food production. Their comments are attached. The private development section stated no peripheral improvements are required at this time. Further development of this parcel may require peripheral improvements to Greenwood Street. MOA Traffic Department requested an updated site plan that shows existing current striping for employee parking and loading berths to confirm the site is compliant with accessible parking space requirements of AMC 21-07-090-J. The Planning and Zoning Commission may approve a conditional use application if, in their judgment of the Commission, all the following nine criteria, criteria have been met in all material matters. Planning staff has found that all nine approval criteria have been met. There are no use specific standards for commercial food production. Therefore, staff recommends approval subject to conditions one, two, and three on page seven of the staff packet. I can answer any questions that the Commission may have and the petitioner's representative is in attendance. Are there any questions for staff?
Okay, we will have the petitioner's presentation. Hi, my name is Ron Thompson with Scope uh, Permitting and Engineering, and I prepared the that held the public meetings and worked with the municipality on providing the documentations that um, allow or hope to allow you guys to understand um, what was needed for the conditional use here. It, uh, I think that um, Paul did a good job explaining it. I think that it makes good sense. Domino's Pizza has um, wanted this facility as soon as they found one large enough to move. They're in a very cramped spot on King Street um, and they are so looking forward to a different facility that is centrally located, eased for getting to all of their buildings um, as well as uh, making it more efficient to do the work and allow them to not only serve the buildings and the places they have but enhance their service and they feel this would allow them ability to to possibly even grow in our community so um, I hope uh, I'll save the rest of my time for any rebuttal you have eight minutes and 51 seconds all right we will open the hearing to public testimony is anyone here wishing to testify Okay, seeing none, we will close the public. Would you want a rebuttal? <laughs> okay, we will close the public hearing. What is the will of the body in case 2023-0129? A uh, motion by Commissioner Gardner, seconded by Commissioner Krishna. Ms. Commissioner Gardner, would you like to state your motion? Sure, thank you. I move in case 2023-0129 to approve a conditional use for commercial food production in the B3 district subject to conditions one through three shown on page seven of the staff report. Do you like to speak to the motion? Um, sure, just briefly, I think um, the approval criteria are satisfied for the reasons presented in the packet. Um, I'll note that there were no public comments received, um, written comments received with the materials, no public comments provided this evening. And um, I think the proposed use will also lead to um, some project funds being spent to bring the site closer to conformity with current code requirements as well. Anyone else wishing to speak to the motion? Um, I intend to support the motion for the reasons that uh, Commissioner Gardner did. I just also want to add that it's it's a great reuse of existing infrastructure. I know these types of properties are hard to find, so it's a good deal, I think, for, for Anchorage. If nobody else is wishing to speak, we will call for the vote. Mr. Strike, how do you vote? Yep. Thank you. That motion passes. I will hand the gavel to Commissioner Krishna. All right, we'll move on to cases 130 and 131. Um, may we have the staff report, please? Yes, thank you, Commissioner Krishna. Uh, case 
2020-01-30 is a request to change the Anchorage 2040 land use plan land use design, designation for one parcel to Main Street corridor with residential mixed use growth supporting features. The plan currently designates the parcel as urban residential high with residential mixed use growth supporting features. Case 2023-0131 uh, is then a request for a rezone uh, to amend the special limitations of the B3 district to allow for self-storage in mixed residential uses. Currently, the special limitations restrict uses to TV and radio stations. Uh, the comprehensive plan amendment is necessary for the rezoning to be supported by the comprehensive plan. The planning department recommends approval of both the comprehensive plan amendment and the rezoning. The site is not suitable for residential development as long as the existing communication towers are in place due to both safety concerns and potential interference with the signal transmission. The developer would like to construct a self-storage facility using garage condominiums on the site. Uh, that would be a use compatible with the existing towers. The towers are expected to be in use for many more years. The proposed development would rehabilitate a distressed property and still allow for future residential mixed use development of the site if the towers were to be removed. The proposed development would incorporate uh, guy wires of the towers into the structure to make the construction possible. This opportunity may not have been considered when the comprehensive plan was written. The development is consistent with the policies of the Anchorage 2040 land use plan, Anchorage 2020 comprehensive plan, and the Spinard Corridor Plan. In the case of the Comprehensive Plan Amendment for Case 130, staff finds criteria A through E are met. The department recommends approval of the amendment to change the land use designation from urban residential high with residential mixed use growth supporting features to Main Street Corridor with residential mixed use growth supporting features. In the case of the rezoning, uh, staff finds criteria one through nine are met with approval of the comprehensive plan amendment and with the additional special limitation to limit uh, impacts to residential uses by potential bulk and height from non-residential uses. Therefore, the department recommends approval for case 131 of the request to rezone the B3 SL, or rezone the property from B3 SL to revise the special limitations to add self-storage and residential mixed use as permitted uses, and to also add the following additional special limitation that non-residential uses within the district shall be subject to the dimensional standards of the R3 district. Uh, and just a reminder that the decision of the commission tonight will serve as a recommendation to the assembly. The assembly will make the final decision on both the comprehensive plan amendment and the rezoning with a separate public hearing. Uh, that's the end of my staff report. Uh, thank you, and the petitioner is in attendance tonight also to speak to the cases. Commissioner Gardner. Um, thank you for that presentation. I have a, um, a, a question with respect to, I guess, case G2, the, um, the um, amendment to the um, land use designation. And I guess my question is, I don't, I don't, and I could easily be wrong about this, but I don't specifically recall seeing a case where we're just rezoning to amend special limitations that also included a change to the land use designation. And I don't read um, Title 21 to, I mean, I guess I, it could be read to not require it. And I'm just curious if there were any discussions, um, well, I guess first, if there's a, a, a practice or understanding that just changing special limitations requires modifying the land use designation. Um, and if not, if there were any discussions within the department as to whether that is in fact strictly necessary here. Uh, thank you for the question, Commissioner Gardner. The change to the special limitations of the B3 zoning district, uh, it does require a rezoning. The comprehensive plan amendment is necessary because the comprehensive plan calls for residential use of the property, so it has a residential land use designation. So it's inconsistent with the currently zoned, uh, the current zoning of B3. Uh, so any change of the zoning district that isn't residential is is going to require a change to the, the land use designation in the comprehensive plan. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I assume that was the case. I just thought I'd ask the question since we weren't changing the underlying district itself. But thank you. Are there any further questions for staff? Seeing none, uh, I think we'll hear from the petitioner. And your time will be doubled because these cases are combined. 20 minutes for um, your uh, speaking and for rebuttal. Thank you. Again, my name is Ron Thompson. I'm with Scope Permitting and Engineering. A um, couple things that maybe we didn't um, point out so much in the in, that staff didn't point out is the towers, part of the towers. A lot of people have asked during that, um, what is the ruling on the towers? Why can't they go? Why can't they be moved? Um, it's a specific FCC guideline that they do not allow any new permits for these type of towers anywhere. Uh, anywhere in the country, not just in Anchorage. It's not just an Anchorage thing, it's anywhere. So these type of uh, facilities are now being try, uh, tried to be developed throughout different places around the country with buildings that can work with the towers. And we got to watch some of the uses with those. In this case, the underlying zoning had multifamily, high, high density, um, living below, um, which uh, in talking with the owner uh, that runs these towers is the interference with the multiple level of Wi-Fi, the multiple level of cell phone activity in a high density living would definitely impact the tower's main function, therefore making it impractical. Um, as part of the submittal on this, I, I believe I submitted a, a PowerPoint presentation that showed multiple different developments throughout the country uh, for these uh, for these sites and it varied almost all of them are commercial in some sense um, because of the fact of the less high density um, communication and Wi-Fi principles with the, regarding to a tower uh, the tower wires the, all of the things that come into play um, with redeveloping a site such as this I mean we can um, I went to the community council. The community council seemed to be, um, they, they, they wanted to know the question about the FCC and the towers themselves. That was a big question in theirs. Uh, the other one was, can this be, can we keep it housing? Uh, we worked that out through the municipality. They put that a guideline in their recommendation and we agreed to it that in the event that in the future if these towers ever went away, I think it's a nice opportunity to have that zoning designation in there so we don't have to do this again. Uh, and, and we agree to those stipulations that they added and the size um, agreement to the R3. So we felt very comfortable with um, with the staff's review, the approval. We tried to do everything that we could to keep the, the um, thinking of what uses would work in an area with the, the traffic flow, the height of the buildings with the other buildings around the area and that's why we chose um, that this seemed to be one of the best fits in the area for uh, very similar to the height of the buildings. Um, it's a very popular um, use anymore for people that have housing that may not have garages and there's not a lot of garages in this area so it's a, uh, I think it's a great opportunity where people can, can get uh, ownership for a storage type facility. It's obviously not commercial use, it's uh, um, the scenario ends up preventing commercial use in this facility like this so it's basically uh, ownership condos um, that that people can store their their private items in and so um, with that we felt the traffic would be very similar to residential it would be very similar in size and height to the area and so um, we feel like we did the due diligence to try to find a good use, a good use of the property, a good um, non-impactful, but also take a property that's been a, a somewhat of a nuisance and a lot of vagrants that have been cutting in through the fence and we have to chase out quite a bit. Um, this with new fencing, with new landscaping, with, with all of the things that we feel um, that we've got a design that fits on the site and works with all of the Title 21 requirements 
requirements that we hope that you can see the same thing and and move for this requirement so the assembly can vote on it as soon as we can. Thank you very much. I'll reserve the rest of my time. You've got 15 minutes and 31 seconds left. Uh, any questions for the okay. Commissioner Polis? Just a quick question. You got any idea how many garage town units can go on the site? Did you guys do a range or something? Uh, yeah, we had a plan. Um, I can't remember how many units there were. Somewhere in the 60 to 80 range, if I remember right, something like that. But we tried to tend to not bring that forward because we didn't want to lock that yeah. down uh, based upon this action. Because if we did, then we'd be right back here doing an amendment to that. Um, so I, I can just say that the layout that we did was multiple buildings laid out in different directions with adequate traffic, adequate landscaping, adequate site obscuring fencing, all of the requirements that meet Title 21. So. And, and when I think of this site, I think of like the garage towns off of like, uh, what is it, Lake Otis in... At 79th? Yeah. yeah. 79th in Lake Otis. Very similar kind of buildings, rectangular type buildings, yeah. Um, but, it, you know, obviously they change in different locations. There's, there's multiple in town that are been um, going up. Some of them look different. Some of them are metal buildings. Some of them are, are wood. Some of them um, are, are tilt uh, wooden frames so I don't know exactly which way we'll go with that that kind of is dictated by the the pricing and the at the time of design but I, I do know that we went through the entire exercise and that uh, we wouldn't be looking for any um, variances or anything outside of what title 21 states for allowing this type of use on that property thank you Commissioner Eber. You mentioned that you looked at various other sites in the country to see what commercial uses that they had used. And I'm just curious what other uses have been used on sites like this throughout the country? Uh, they have office buildings that have, have done, they've incorporated one into a mall structure, uh, into a commercial mall. Um, they're, most of them were commercial office type of space, not really high traffic, not high retail, but the, the only one that was kind of the retail was at the mall site that it was in the back end and they were able to tie it to the mall and connect the guy wires into some of the structure. So most of it was, was um, office type spaces. Any further questions? Hearing none, we will open uh, this item to public testimony. Are there any members of the public wishing, wishing to testify? Seeing none, uh, would you like to make a rebuttal? comment that I'd like to say is um, we also looked at this site would not be a good site for office and business kind of uses in the middle of a, a neighborhood and so um, that position was discussed about what would be good and that was one of the ones that also didn't seem to be appropriate for this site. So. Thank you, and we'll uh, go ahead and close this hearing. What's the will of the body? Moved by Commissioner Gardner. Commissioner Gardner, would you like to state your motion? 
Yes, thanks. I move in case 2023-0130 to recommend to the Anchorage Assembly approval of the amendment to the Anchorage 2040 land use plan to change the land use designation from urban residential high with residential mixed use growth supporting features to Main Street Corridor with residential mixed use growth supporting features. Seconded by Commissioner Eber. Commissioner Gardner, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you. Just briefly, I think the um, approval criteria are met for the reasons stated in the staff packet. Um, specifically, I'll point out that um, I think the amendment is necessary to address a, um, a new opportunity not adequately addressed in the comprehensive plan. This site really isn't um, viable with the towers um, for any sort of residential use, and it's not really receiving any use at the moment, and I think this is a great opportunity to allow it to be developed, um, which this um, amendment is necessary for. I will also note that we received no public comments um, this evening, and I don't believe there were any public comments included in our packet. Would anyone else like to speak to this motion? Seeing no one, we'll call for a vote. Mr. Strike, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. That motion passes. And now we have the second case, which I believe we have to vote on separately. Moved by Commissioner Pullis, uh, seconded by Commissioner Winchester. Commissioner Pullis, would you like to state your motion? Yes, thank you. Uh, I move in case 2023-0131 to recommend the, to the Anchorage Assembly approval of the rezone of one property from B3SL, um, General Business with Special Limitations District, to revise the special limitations to add self-storage and residential mixed use as permitted uses and to add non-residential uses with the district shall be subject to the dimensional standards of the R3 district as an additional special limitation. Would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, I would. Um, it meets all the requirements as stated in the packet. Um, the applicant actually stated they would meet uh, the Title 21 and 23 requirements without a variance, most likely. Um, we heard no public opposition. Um, they had a good informative PI process. Um, and it also retains the additional ability for future residential use. So I intend to support the motion. Would anyone else like to speak to this motion? Seeing no one, we will call for a vote. Mr. Streich, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. That motion passes. And now we are on to our last item. Um, but first, we will take a five-minute break and get our chair back.
Are we ready to get this, uh, get this show on the road? Okay. Can we have staff presentation on case 2023-0127? Um, through the chair, uh, the assembly is going to make and be making the presentation on um, this case, uh, but I would like to point out that um, we received uh, public comments uh, after the packet went out, and that's in uh, the supplementary packet number one for G4. Um, also, um, the, the, app, um, the assembly sent us a revised version of the ordinance and that's in a, a memo that was uh, um, sent out to you and um, left for the public at the, at the entrance as well. Thank you. Well, hello, Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, uh, we will have the petitioner's presentation, please. So I think I don't have the little clicker button anymore, and I think um, legislative services no longer here, but I was just going to give like a high-level overview. Name first. Assembly Member Voland, Daniel Voland. Um, so... Um, yeah, what I'll say is um, really the overarching goal of this ordinance is to make it so that in residential zones, as well as a few commercial zones, we would be able to treat triplex and fourplex more in line with how we treat single family and duplex development. Um, the largest change that this ordinance would make is a reduction of the minimum lot size in R2M to 6,000 square feet. Um, it also amends the side setback for triplex and fourplex to be uh, five feet instead of 10 feet in those residential zones. Um, there's a couple things that I do want to clarify. Uh, the intent of the sponsors really is that this would impact R2M, R3, R3A, R4, and R4A. Um, in the supplementary packet that you were sent um, with the S version, there are a, a couple things that I think need correction, and I just want to point those out. Um, one would be there's a Voland Amendment number one attached. So I will not be moving that. <laughs> this, this was something that was drafted, I think, as a misunderstanding between myself and Assembly Council. Um, the um, Amendment 1 here um, looks to make triplex and fourplex a permitted use in R2A and R2D. Um, my perspective is that that would not be consistent with the 2040 land use plan um, because R2D and R2A are included in single and two family uh, land use designation. So um, we did look at, at one point at could you have multiple structures on a lot in R2D and R2A? Um, so for instance, could you have a detached duplex? where you have two um, primary dwellings that are the same size. I think that's an interesting question um, for contemplation and would, and would welcome recommendations from your commission on that. But I don't think that we want to put um, triplex and fourplex in those zonings that are really meant to be uh, duplex neighborhoods. Um, and then there's two tables here of allowed uses, two different exhibits. And one has the circles on it, so that's exhibit A, I think it says... I'm, I'm guessing that means revised one. Um, and so where you see R2A and R2D um, being an administrative site plan mm -hmm. review, um, that I do not believe is the, the intent of the sponsors. It should just, again, start in R2M. Um, with that, I, I think you guys have kind of heard the presentation on the ordinance, and um, I would welcome any questions.
Are there any questions? Uh, if I could actually, Mr. Chair, speak to one more thing. Amendment number two, and this is, I do want to clarify from the, from the earlier presentation as well. Um, this looks to restore the, um, the snow storage requirement for four units. Um, I misspoke earlier, and currently um, the snow storage um, exempted from it are single family, two family, and three unit multifamily. Um, and this, the co-sponsors are comfortable with restoring that requirement for four units and up. I, I have a question. So on amendment two, we're saying we're good with ignoring that one? The proposed amendment two? Amendment two. That's the snow storage. Which it, um, no, I think that that will likely be moved by the oh. co-sponsors. Okay, so we're that's yeah. a keeper. Amendment one will not be moved. Amendment number two will be. But again, I mean, I'm just saying that's the current intention. Of course, we'd want to look to your recommendations as well. And then back to the table. Can you tell me what page number we're talking about? Yes, sir. 13. And then... So there's, there's a table on 13 and a table on 15. It looks like table 15 might be the right one. I think 15 is more consistent with the intentions of the co-sponsors. Okay. I, I think I know what's going on here. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions for Assemblymember Voland? You have six minutes for rebuttal, and we will move to the public hearing. Is Anyone from the public wishing to testify? Thank you. And if you could just restate your name in the microphone when you're ready, that would be great. You're on behalf of the Community Council? Um, you can start. Well, oh, sorry. Um, so we've been really involved and interested in all the work going on about housing in Anchorage and agree that we have a crisis. And we really appreciate a lot of work being done. The Housing Action Summit recently we attended, um, and a lot of good ideas are coming out. At the same time, we've been frustrated that a lot of ideas come out with a very short time frame to look at them, and they're pretty complex, things like this ordinance. Um, and now we understand there's an S version, which we haven't seen. So um, some of my comments may end up not being applicable anymore because we just haven't had time to review everything. Um, in the version that we did see, the whereas statements that document the increases in housing prices and slow rate of new housing construction, we really appreciate, but we would like to see a reference to the 2018 study that shows strong support for cottage-style housing deleted, because this doesn't seem to be equivalent to three and four-plex housing, which can now be 180 feet long and three stories high. Um, we're concerned that the whereas statements only talk about two of the goals from the Anchorage 2040 land use plan, which was very carefully put together with a lot of public input. And so there's some other things that we feel, and, and especially where it talked about targeting infill and increased density in specific areas, there should be more reference back to that plan. Um, the 2020 plan talked about neighborhood identity and vitality. We're, uh, 
concerned about how these guidelines encourage this when uh, neighborhoods, the distinctiveness really might be based on factors like yards, landscaping, and traditional architecture. Um, we want to make sure that area-specific plans for these zones that are affected um, do address the goals and guidance um, that those plans are going to be still maintained in this, this, uh, with this ordinance. Um, goal six of the land use plan talks about accessible land use. We're concerned about how non-motorized transportation would be supported in these areas, given that infill may increase density up to 30 units per acre the way it currently is. Uh, goal seven of the land use plan is also very important, 7.1 and 7.2. Um, compatible design is a key part of successful infill and redevelopment, so we want to make sure that the important design standards that have been so carefully put in our plans remain in place. Um, this is a really complex issue, and we're concerned that the staff didn't have time to do a full analysis. We would have really appreciated seeing some drawings that could help uh, explain how things are going to be changing. Um, and it sounds like there's some better things coming with this S version, but we haven't had a chance to really review it yet. Um, we like the guidelines of 2040 land use plan and Title 21.07, which provide for well-designed targeted infill and development in areas where there is supportive transportation and public utilities and services. And we're concerned that changes in 103 might sever zoning decisions from planning decisions. Um, we do agree with the version that the future density uh, might be up to 30 uh, dwelling units in R2M, but we don't like the fix the planning staff suggested that they just change that to, to um, be fewer units because it doesn't recognize ADUs, which are now allowed. And so it seems that that's a density calculation that is not really accounted for in this um, ordinance, and it should be. So we agree with the staff report to remove the um, dwelling small multifamily as a new use based on the explanation of overlapping definitions. Um, we're glad to hear about the snow storage area now being retained. Uh, it wasn't in that earlier version. We want to retain the marine commercial distinct district for non-residential uses. We want to retain standards relative to landscaping because these will help hide increased density by providing a more appealing outside appearance. And we heard a lot about that at the Housing Action Week from the Strong Town's Charles Marone. Um, we would recommend that side setbacks be kept at 10 feet rather than being decreased because that will help uh, remain maintain the access to daylight and sunlight and provide privacy, which is valued in neighborhoods. Um, we advocate targeted density, as I said, so it can be supported by upgraded infrastructure and public services. And we would hope that the staff recommendations that remove conflicts uh, now seen with the planning code are fixed and um, that we retain design and setback requirements to create attractive, desirable, and distinctive neighborhoods. Um, and we want to make sure that that one uh, segment, which is listed in our, I won't give you all the numbers, so that ADUs be counted in density calculations. And thank you for attention to our concerns. And it just seems like there needs to be a little bit more time for people to really evaluate and uh, understand this and before it's really put forward final. Thank you. Um, yeah, your time is up. Um, I do have one question for you. But I will make a comment that this is a recommendation from the assembly. It's here almost as a formality, and there will be another public hearing at the assembly. So there's, there's more time. Um, are there any com questions from the commission? I, I just had uh, one question on your uh, statement on side yards. In the R2M, you can build a large duplex with a five-foot setback. If you were building, say, a smaller building but with four units, do you still think that the side yard setback should be increased to 10 feet just because there's four units, even though the building might be smaller? You know, that's a, a really good question, and I was thinking about as we're going through this, that we talk about lot size, but we don't talk about building sizes for the three and four plexes, and I'm wondering whether maybe that should be part of what ultimately comes out here to consider that. And, and so maybe, um, yeah, if it's a smaller building, uh, a little smaller setback might be appropriate. But depending on how high it is and um, how, because one thing is I think this is going to increase building sizes can increase from 150 feet to 180 feet 
Um, so then you're taking up a lot more of the lot size. So that's perhaps one um, aspect that should be added into this somehow. Uh, and I think that the assembly is having those conversations. We heard some of this in the work session, so I think that those will come out. Right. And, and perhaps the, um, I think the planning staff might have some really good ideas about that. They've been working with these buildings for a long time. Okay, we have another um, question from Commissioner George. Good evening, Ms. Rappaport. Thank you for uh, presenting this evening and for providing this letter from the Community Council. Um, I guess maybe this is more of a community council specific question, but um, what we're being tasked with here and contemplating is modifying things like side setbacks in an entire zoning district and reducing it potentially for future development. Um, from a community perspective, um, it would seem that the setbacks between properties, particularly multifamily properties, um, being reduced might change the characteristic of a neighborhood. And I know in Rabbit Creek you have many homes that are not five or ten feet apart from one another. Um, can you maybe comment on how setback might be an important characteristic of a neighborhood? Well, I think as I said, that things like sunlight, um, you know, nobody wants to, I have friends actually who live in the Turnigan area who just had somebody tear down the house next door and build this humongous thing that shadows, you know, somebody on one side of them completely lost their yard. Uh, or any sun that ever came into it and now has this monstrous wall they're looking at. So um, that, that's where your neighborhood uh, characteristics come into play and you want things to look attractive. And, and a lot of it could be the design eventually of whoever does it. You know, if they build a huge square thing, it's not very attractive. If you do it where you have um, walls that are in and set in and out, it, a building can look more attractive and maybe be the same size. But it seems like five feet might just be a little bit small for um, having larger buildings next to each other. And, and, and again, the lot thing, I mean, the whole offset, because if it's, if it's taken up the whole lot, that's one thing. If it's, you've got them staggered, maybe front and back, you can uh, somehow give more sunshine to everybody and space. And thank you, and that led right into my next question or contemplation, which is if you've got a single family or a duplex, uh, both five feet from the, the property line, that's you know, one or two or you know, two or three or four families potentially being within 10 feet of one another. But if you have an increase in density where you can have three, four or more units depending on which zoning, you, know, uh, you could have four families or more very, very close to one another in uh, very close proximity. So um, I guess that goes back to the characteristic of a neighborhood. I'm sorry. I guess that goes back to the characteristic of a neighborhood. Right, right. And whether you're living in, in a place where you're expecting really dense things or whether you want to have um, the aspect that you have your own home and, and you have some privacy in places. Thank and, you. and there were great, you know, at the Housing Action Week, they had some great photos shown of, play, of buildings that had become three, four plexes that look like one family or you have got different entrances and, and can be very attractively done. question is, will they be done that way or will they be cheap things thrown up that look yucky. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify? Hi, uh, my name is Alexa Dobson, and um, I'm here speaking on behalf of myself tonight um, in support, and support of the ordinance. Um, the reason for my support is simple. I own and live in a fourplex. I think it's great, and I think we need more of them. Um, for me, buying a multifamily property was really the only viable path to home ownership that was available to me as a single young professional. Um, I was born and raised in Anchorage. I got my college degree from APU, and I knew that I wanted to be able to buy a house in Anchorage, but even before the pandemic, the single family housing prices were totally out of reach for me as a person on a single salary. Um, so my solution was to purchase a fourplex and owner occupy the property and simply I support this because I want others to have that same opportunity for home ownership. And then obviously on the flip side, any one or, or 
lot that would previously have had one or two units on it that now has three or four, this is an increase in housing stock and essentially that's what we need in order to address the housing crisis in Anchorage. So uh, for all these reasons, I hope you'll vote in favor of the um, ordinance and thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? I see no questions. Hi, my name is Nancy Pease. I'm speaking on my own behalf this evening. Some of what I put before you is outdated or inapplicable because I also did not know there would be an S version laid before you today. Um, I think it was the chair who said this is a formality, but I ask you to rethink that. You're the Planning and Zoning Commission, and it's important that this not be just rezoning, but that it be fully compatible with our plans and that we have a process a planning process that involves people like me and the community councils. So I have four points. Um, first, the lack of public access to illustrated examples and graphics and analysis and the last minute S version have made it pretty impossible for community councils and people like me to make informed comments. And that's what we should be <laughs> bringing to is informed comments. There were no comments on the earlier version, and it's, it's probably no surprise, and there are very few people here tonight. Um, second point, I'm glad to hear that the S version doesn't introduce these three and four plexes into the R2A and the R2D, because the work hasn't been done for that expansion. I am generally in favor of one intent of the ordinance, which is to remove obstacles to developing three and four plexes where they're already intended but I oppose the expansion of those uh, units wholesale into R2A and R2D um, because there hasn't been the analysis to show how that shift would work with the community and specifically how that shift would work with our adopted plans. And we have um, Anchorage 2040 Land Use Plan Goal 6, which calls for accessible land use and, and requires us to plan transportation together with denser development. And we have um, land use plan goal seven, which talks about accommodating and contributing to the character, scale, and identity of established neighborhoods. Again, the, if the S version isn't moving into the two R2A and the R2D, that's not quite so much of a concern, but it is something that we should always be looking at. Are we, meet, are we at least addressing all the goals? We can't meet every goal with every ordinance, but we shouldn't work contrary to any of the goals. Is, is, is one, I think, approach to take. Um, just really quickly, as we move forward, I like, would like to ask that we have a different accounting technique for densities. Let's look at the true densities at full build out by including accessory dwelling units in the density calculations. That's not the subject of this amendment, but as planners, I urge you to consider the importance of doing that. And finally, let's take three and four plexes out of the marine commercial areas save those as our economic engines. So thank you very much for your time. I wish I could be more informed and on point, but I just saw the S version moments ago. Any questions from the commission? We have a com question from Commissioner Gardner. Thank you for your testimony. I was just wondering if you could briefly elaborate on, um, I guess there's not a number here, but one portion of your comments here uh, suggests that the ordinance ignores likely negative impacts on several other goals and what what did you have in mind for that that was more of a point when I read wrote this and I thought that the new um, design standards were going to be applied in the R2A and the R2D and those neighborhoods have very specific identities based on their traditional architecture and the amount of gardens and that sort of thing and um, 
it didn't seem to me that the impacts of much larger three and four plexes had been analyzed with regard to that, but it's, it's probably not relevant right now. Okay, thank you. Yep. No more questions. Hi, I'm Eric Visser. I'm a builder here in Anchorage. I'm testifying on behalf of myself tonight. Um, I would just urge your uh, recommendation for approval of this ordinance. I think that um, we're, we all know we're experiencing a housing crisis here in Anchorage. Um, and I like to look back and see kind of why, why we think we got here. And I, it's at some point, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, somebody drew the line between uh, building codes and saying, you know, how are we going to regulate 100 unit apartment buildings and how are we going to separate that from single family home construction? And there has to be a line between 100 units and one unit. And somebody decided to draw that line at between two and three, right? So I think the overall goal of this ordinance is really just to move that line just a little bit further to between four and five units because we already have an ecosystem that's set up in place in this country to get housing financing for one to four family units. That's already in place. The federal government realizes that those are similar types of construction, but the Anchorage municipality does not. And <clears throat> I've been looking for data to try and figure out how many actual units we've lost out on <clears throat> in this city because of those zoning um, requirements that we've had. And I don't know if it's in the thousands, but I guarantee it's over a thousand units that the city could currently have if we had zoning regulations similar to this in place that would allow people to build these triplex and fourplex units. Because as we discussed in the work session, it's a heck of a lot easier for us to build a duplex than it is a triplex. And just to put like real numbers on it, I can go buy a piece of property and to get a set of plans designed for a duplex cost me about $12,000, maybe $15,000, and then I go get the permits and I'm ready to get in the ground, start moving dirt. To do a triplex, it opens up this whole other ecosystem of planning and plans that we have to get, and the cost goes from like twelve dollars to $15,000 all the way up to over $50,000, just for the plants. That's just to start moving dirt. So I think from our perspective, or from my perspective personally, um, there's a lot of unintended consequences with that. I feel like it drives up the cost of housing, uh, takes a major hit on housing affordability. Um, housing affordability is at an all-time low right now, so uh, anything we can do to kind of move that needle uh, to allow more people to get into homes in Anchorage, I think is a good decision. So with that, I'll take any questions. We have a question from Commissioner Krishna. Sure. Have you looked at the newest version of this ordinance? And do you believe that the ordinance as written does those things that you're stating, which are the goals of this commission and the assembly? Or do you have any recommendations as this commission looks to um, accomplish those goals? Um, one of the main concerns that I have is the uh, landscaping requirements. I think the way the current code is with landscaping doesn't fit with triplex and fourplex lots. I'm totally open to having some sort of landscaping requirements, but maybe carve out like a new section because what, you know, trying to put the townhome development landscaping requirements on a triplex and fourplex lot or a 6,000 square foot lot, it's just not gonna work and it's gonna take away buildable area for the space. So if there could be some other solution to that, I would, I would recommend that. But the current landing, landscaping requirements that we have just don't fit. Um, snow storage, there's a lot of other ways to deal with snow storage, um, snow storage agreements, that sort of thing. Uh, so I don't see that as a requirement or a necessary requirement to be in this ordinance. But I think overall it does uh, achieve what the uh, assembly is looking to do. Question from Commissioner George. Thank you. Um, we've got a lot of potential changes here to mm -hmm. try and incentivize um, building of triplexes and fourplexes and largely in places where they're already allowed. And, um, and I think that trying to help those who want to build them make it possible is definitely something we should shoot for. Um, we've got height 
maximum considerations. We've got design standards, snow storage, um, setback, um, min you know, lot sizes, units per lot. Um, you know, if you, if you had consideration of uh, setbacks or more units per lot based on the square footage of the lot, which one of those being changed would be more impactful to, to you as you consider potentially building? I mean, going from a 10 foot to a five foot setback, is that gonna be the game changer? Or being able to build uh, six units where you could build three before, which one of those is gonna be more impactful to you as a potential builder? I, uh, I guess I would say it's more of the permitting requirements that are imposed on triplexes and fourplexes rather than the setbacks or the number of units that are allowed. Because like these zoning districts are already allowed, you're already allowed to build a triplex and fourplex, but it's the planning and permitting requirements that get attached to that, that drive up the cost substantially, that affects why we don't want to build triplexes and fourplexes right now. So that's, that's kind of what this ordinance is trying to fix. Thank you, that's very helpful. You know, as, as we look at all of these um, that have the potential to you know, change the characteristic of a neighborhood, um, if it's the permitting requirements and the standards and that sort of thing that are really the most impactful, um, you know, we, we've got to consider each of these elements, are all of them all necessary to make this happen, or is it simpler? You know, because we've got a pretty significant wide uh, array of changes in front of us. So mm -hmm. um, for some who can, you know, maybe you're having a hard time swallowing all this at once. Yeah. And we just want to see these three and four plexes be built where they're supposed to be built or where they were originally contemplated to be built. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm personally struggling right now with the reduction from 10 to five feet on a, a fourplex uh, for side setbacks. Mm -hmm. You know, where you could have two fourplexes 10 feet apart. It's just, I'm, I'm really struggling with that. But um, knowing that it's, permitting, that it's standards, that it's potentially, you know, which building code, whether it's residential or commercial, if those are the real things that are making the difference, then why are we, why are we taking up other things that are maybe uh, unnecessary to take up in this context? So that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Well, I think some of these changes are required to change how these things get permitted. Um, but thinking about just, if you have a 6,000 square foot lot, the size of a duplex that you could put on it, you know, you can put the same size duplex as you could a same size fourplex. And that's, I think, what a lot of the discussions that we had previous to this is that, you, yes, you are, going, you, you are going to build more units, but you can't physically build four 2,000 square foot units on a 6,000 square foot lot. It's going to be virtually impossible to do that. So you're going to have to create smaller units, which will in turn have, give you similarities between the mass that you had in a duplex building and the mass that you have in a fourplex building on a 6,000 square foot lot. So I guess from a builder's perspective, those things are gonna start looking pretty much the same when this is allowed. And it's just, they're gonna be allowed because it's gonna be cheaper for us to build them. That's what's gonna create these units. Thank you. Mm -hmm. See no more questions. Anyone else wishing to testify? Good evening, Chris Schutte, S-C-H-U-T-T-E. I'm a private community development specialist. Um, I was fortunate to join the municipal staff, assembly members, and other volunteers over the past six months to work on this issue. Um, thank you to the department and the assembly sponsors for proposing an ordinance that will streamline and simplify residential development codes, making multifamily townhouse developments with less than five units, although that is kind of a mouthful, uh, more feasible and more attainable in Anchorage. Uh, these code changes will be tools that designers and builders can begin using immediately thanks to the effective date uh, firmly set at January 1st. We started down this road because while three and four unit residential projects do qualify for residential financing, what you find is that anything larger than a duplex is permitted by the municipality as a commercial development, setting in, host a whole, uh, in, setting in motion a whole host of other reviews and other permitting requirements that ultimately make a triplex and a, and a fourplex feel much more like a 300 unit apartment building. But even before projects come to the municipality to be permitted, the underlying zoning requirements for things like setbacks and minimum lot size already limit what, uh, where three and four unit residential buildings uh, are allowed. And as a result, we rarely see any of them built. 
We started this project by asking a question, is it possible to treat three and four unit residential buildings like we treat single family and duplexes? We looked at zoning changes that have happened across the country in other cities, specifically focusing on Memphis, Tennessee, and what they've done to treat up to six unit residential buildings as single family. Building from the best practices that we drew from other communities and the expertise of staff and community development volunteers, this ordinance gets us closer to that vision. That being said, there are still code-related code uh, issues that will potentially inhibit the creation of new three and four unit residential buildings. For example, uh, this does not allow three and four units in all our districts, as you heard earlier, um, nor does it address some of the uh, most expensive prohibitions that exist in the design criteria manual as it relates to drainage. Um, as other uh, uh, testifiers have commented, there is a lot of moving parts and pieces, so some of my comments may already be out of date but I wanted to suggest um, a couple of corrections or amendments. Number one, uh, the amendment, second amendment that is now removing the snow storage, or I guess reinstating the snow storage requirement for fourplexes and above, um, I would encourage the commission to consider retaining the original language that did exempt three and four unit residential buildings from snow storage. And though it's beyond the scope of the resolution, if the commission could make some sort of statement about the importance of changing DCM chapter two, specifically section 3.3.1.2, uh, to uh, lift the uh, requirements that befall the developments of three and four plexes uh, that put them in the same design, uh, sorry, the same uh, drainage standards as large buildings and large structures, um, that would be very helpful. Overall, these code changes are thoughtful and helpful and will be very valuable in, in encouraging housing unit production. Thank you. Would you like to restate the code section of the DCM that you just <laughs> rattled off? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, it's from the DCM chapter two, which deals with drainage. Um, the specific section is 3.3.1.2. And the title of that subsection is called Small Projects. I even have a recommended language if you want to hear it. Let me ask, are, are there any other questions from the commission? Commissioner Polis. I, I just have a question about the snow storage reduction. Everybody wants to get snow storage removed, but I feel like it's, I feel like the drainage and the, um, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here because I'm on the spot, but the drainage and uh, definitely not snow is the hardest one to do. It's literally drawing a dashed, dashed line on your plans. It seems easy to me, but the, um, the parking's gone. The landscaping and the drainage seem like the two big things to me. So I'm just kind of curious as to why snow storage seems like a, a big reduction thing, if you can elaborate on that. Yeah. Great question, thank you, and through the chair. Um, anytime you have to draw a, dot, a dotted line on a site plan, you're beginning to eliminate the developable area of a plot. And so in the spirit of encouraging triplexes and four, or I guess fourplexes, on a variety of sized parcels in Anchorage where they, uh, they may not have the adequate size to provide enough snow storage and create a fourplex of moderately sized units that are marketable. Um, so we just felt that uh, allowing each site to deal with snow removal and snow retainage in its own way without requiring it to go through uh, the development of a site plan that, that draws that dotted line and removes significant portions of the overall developable land uh, would be a, a better way to get towards that goal. I say that as we all suffered through massive amounts of snow in November, I realize it sounds a little ridiculous, but it does make a difference. Well, and, and I ask that question because every time something like this comes up right away, it says, please don't, you know, and we all just kind of turn our heads. So I, I just had to ask the question. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I, I guess I will ask, what is your recommended language for the DCM <laughs> change? Thank you. I, uh, I couldn't recite it fast enough. My clock went too quickly. Um, Language that I think would be very beneficial for, uh, tri or for fourplexes and triplexes is small projects are projects of three or four family homes with less than 10,000 square feet of land disturbance area or a filling grade permit for a residential single or duplex, uh, sorry, residential single family or duplex involving only one lot with less than 5,000 cubic yards of fill. And I'd be happy to email it. Thank you.
Anybody else wishing to testify? Seeing none. Oh, we will go to the phones. Say who we're going to call. You want to start with Diane Holmes? Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please consult your directory and... Yeah, I'm doing that. Um, so, 9-07-250-0545. Connect. Thank you. <laughs> Save me. Hello. Hello, is this Diane Holmes? Yes. Hi, Diane. Um, this is the Planning and Zoning Commission calling for public testimony in case 2023-0127. Are you testifying yes. as an individual or uh, as a representative of a group? No, um, I'm speaking for myself tonight. Okay, um, you have uh, three minutes to testify. Would you please uh, state your full name and then you may begin? Hi, I'm Diane Holmes. This is really a complex issue that deserves more time and public understanding, but I don't think that's likely. Um, I am in favor of allowing three and four plexus to be removed from commercial building codes, but with the following conditions. In the field, we're designated in 2040 and where public utilities and infrastructure exist. Some districts, like most of R6, can't meet those requirements, but it's not clear to me if R6 is still in this ordinance. After the deadly fire in an apartment recently, don't waste time fighting the fire codes to reduce costs. And don't remove snow storage requirements. That's obvious. The recent housing summit and guest speaker highlighted building for what people want, want to live in, not just for density. So I believe 6,000 square feet of lots are too small for three and four plexes. And landscaping is a big part of what makes a city decent, so don't delete that requirement and consider keeping warranty guarantees. Think of Industry Way and Hoffman Business Park in a minimal space it is one of the most beautiful short drives. Some have asked what the difference is between a single family versus a three or four plex on the same lot, size lot. And I can tell you that three or four families versus one bring different views of safety and usage to the table. And that's why safety can't be compromised. I believe side setbacks are a safety feature and should not be deleted. Over the years, industrial lands have been reduced or used for other purposes, and Anchorage is poor for that. Regarding the Marine Commercial District, which I didn't even know we had, staff recommends prohibiting three and four plexes, and I agree. In the quest to build more housing, let's not go back to the 60s and 70s, where codes were pretty much whoever was holding the hammer. Let's build something where you would want to live. 
Finally, please read the very detailed Rabbit Creek Community Council comments with their support for this AO, though with targeted infill for 2040, with needed con corrections to some whereas statements, other 2040 in inconsistencies and disagreement with the general R24 density increase, and then especially the need for density calculations to include ADUs, which I totally agree with. They should be included. Thank you. I have a question from Commissioner Krishna. Uh, more of a yeah. comment. Uh, Ms. Holmes, I just want to inform you that R6 is not included in this version of the ordinance and to let you know that there'll be another opportunity to comment before the assembly. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, and I'm glad for that clarification because this is really complex. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I see no further questions. Um, next caller. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please Hi, good evening. Hi, Joan. This is the Planning and Zoning Commission calling for public testimony on case 2023-0127. Are you testifying as an individual or are you representing a group? Oh, um, uh, I'm sorry, could you say the, 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 the number again? Yes, um, this is um, case 2023-0127. It's an ordinance um, uh, amending regulations for three and four unit residential developments. Hold on. Is that all it does? Because the ones that we were looking at as, as a board member of the, the HALO organization was the, the one that keeps going through another um, uh, um, incarnation uh, that that uh, was affecting R6, R7, um, and R2M, and, and that. And, and then there was a separate one that was affecting the three and four unit residential development. Which one is this? <laughs> and do you, do you, is, am, I say, am I making sense to you? Um, Joan, I, I'm also a little confused. Um, the the ordinance uh, the original version of, of of this ordinance did include um, the R6 uh, district and it is primarily aimed at um, the R2M uh, district. Um, so this has to do with um, the development of three and four dwelling unit uh, developments, um, but the current version the the newest version that was sent to a. a that's been shared with the public um, does not include the R6 district. Oh, it doesn't? Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, because that was, that was what the HALO was, con was very concerned about uh, with R6 up here especially. So that's been removed from this ordinance then. So it, is it three and four unit residential development in, in all? Zoning or, or just limited to like R2M at this point and some others? Um, I, it's limited to the R2 districts. However, I, I think that um, we should probably stop discussing this and um, you should um, explain your prepared uh, comments on the case irregardless of 
now that we know we're talking about the right case, I think you should share your comments um, so that they can be re uh, recorded. Even though R6 has been removed? Yes, I think that uh, you should still uh, testify even if um, those comments might be dated um, because this is your sort of one shot at doing that in front of the commission, the planning and zoning. Yeah, commission. right, right. Well, you never know. They could, they could always add it back in. All right. Um, uh, hold on. Let me take my jacket off here. Um, <clears throat> certainly, I, I would be happy to testify. Um, you have uh, three minutes to testify, and uh, please state your name. You may begin. Yes, certainly. Um, good evening, folks. Uh, this is Joan Priestley. Last name spelled P-R-I-E-S, like in Sam, T-L-E-Y. And I am a resident of the South Anchorage area, the Hillside District specifically. Um, even though the, the R6 zoning has been removed from the most recent incarnation of this ordinance, um, I, it, was, it has been suggested to me that I should deliver my original testimony. Uh, even so, it would be good to get this on the record because you never know when these other zones are going to be re-included, uh, especially R6. So I wanted to let you know that R6 up here and, and in the, on the hillside area and R8 uh, and R10, uh, some R9 are the, are the primary zonings that are up here, and they were instituted in the 1980s specifically to counteract what had been really um, reckless, selfish, overblown uh, development that was going on here in the Hillside area. Uh, it was a, a several-year process and with a lot of citizen input, and those zones are basically defined by the topo topography up here and the water tables and the water runoff, which is a continuing problem, uh, and uh, the nitrates and other situations that we have, the slopes especially. And R10, for example, is determined uh, exclusively by, by slope measurements uh, to, to um, figure that to calculate the lot sizes that would be involved. So we think that it would be a great travesty to start overbuilding again on these the R6, 8, 9, and 10 zones, uh, even though they have been removed, thank goodness, from the most recent incarnation. At, at some point, uh, the, lead, the assembly that is really not familiar with, with the topographic limitations and problems up here could easily reinstate R6 uh, and R8, R10. And we are, are, I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to, to, uh, to go on record opposing that inclusion um, uh, because the, this area cannot support more than a, than a limited development of residential dwellings. And with the accessory dwelling units that can be separate houses up here, we've automatically doubled the, the, the number of, of dwellings that can exist per lot. Um, and that is going to, inc to incur severe runoff problems uh, even more so than, than we have here. There are a lot of water problems with, with uh, uh, drainage and, and, and runoff and seepage, uh, and including R6 uh, in, in an area uh, that, that can support three and four units, I I, you, uh, ignores the reality of, of our, our, our land up here. Thank your, you. Your, your time is up, Ms. Priestley. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I do have one question for you. Given that we have well and septic permitting standards in the city of Anchorage and knowing that you couldn't build buildings on, say, an R6 lot, even though this ordinance doesn't propose to allow that, I just want to hear your, com your comment on, do you feel if a six-bedroom house can be permitted with an approved septic system, do you feel that it's worse to have four one-bedroom units in a fourplex on that same lot? Do you, do you feel that, that there's some sort of problem with that? 
or objection to that? Uh, yes, actually, because the only access road to this entire area off of Hillside is Upper De um, that's, that's the main access road. It's, it's an, extremely, in a, an extremely poor condition, and there's no money allotted to improve it. And if you have a uh, fourplex, so let's, should, let's make it even. Let's have a, 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 six, a sixplex as opposed to one six-bedroom house you're likely to have a lot more cars uh, tra traversing up and down our uh, Armin on a daily basis than with with a, 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 a sixplex than with one house that has six bedrooms. Um, and that's, that's a separate problem that we are, are continuing to face. Um, a, a, a six-bedroom a, a six house is not likely to have six bathrooms, but a sixplex would, so you're you're increasing the the water usage by by not an exponential amount, but far more that by putting in more units, even though there's the same number of bedrooms, um, and uh, also a, a, a sixplex could necessitate more driveways depending on the configuration of the property, uh, which which then of course has more impermeable area of the, of the property, which will worsen the water runoff rather than having one house with one driveway. Okay, thank you. No further questions. I, I see no further mm -hmm. questions. That was a good question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. Good night. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to testify before we close the public hearing? Seeing none, we will now allow for rebuttal. Well, thank you, Commissioners, Assemblymember Daniel Voland. Um, this has been a great discussion, and I appreciate a lot of the public testimony that we've heard tonight. Um, I think all I will say in rebuttal is I, I would love to answer Commissioner George's question about sort of which is the bigger game changer. And, and I don't think it's the setbacks, frankly. I think that the big game changer is the reduction of the lot size in R2M uh, because that will free up just over 3,700 lots to have the potential for development or redevelopment to triplex or fourplex. So adding those infill units. And I think that's all I have. Thank you very much for hearing us tonight. I do have a question from Commissioner Krishna. Yeah, there's been some confusion about the districts. Could you clarify whether the table on page 13 of our packet or 15 of our packet is the one that's uh, moving forward? To me, um, it's the table on page 15 that is more aligned with the assembly co-sponsor's intent, not the one on page 13. Um, because page 13, uh, that appears to make triplex and fourplex um, permitted subject to site plan review in R2A and R2D. Um, and as I clarified previously, it is not the intent of the assembly co-sponsors to allow triplex and fourplex where they are not already allowed. Thank you. Question from Commissioner Eber. Yeah, I think the main issues that were brought up in the public testimony were that there's not enough time to review, um, that the, the setbacks were an issue, and then most people wanted an inclusion of ADUs. Can you kind of speak to what your thoughts are on those three bullet points on not having enough time and potential? I guess you kind of did address the setbacks, that not being as big of an issue as other items. but. Um, I know we talked, one of the other commissioners early discussed, you know, including the ADUs, but maybe that does need to be addressed in this ordinance. The three, um, say them one more time, there's the setbacks, the ADUs. And, and not was, enough time for the public to kind of um, review the new S version. Yep, so as far as more time um, to process the S version, 
I think that that is a discussion that myself and my co-sponsors need to have um, on whether there's a potential, you know, right now the plan is for this to be back before the assembly on December 19th. Um, and, uh, you know, I realize some of the community councils change their schedules with the holidays, for instance. Um, so I, I do think that that is something that we need to contemplate. Um, on the setbacks, I think there's two sides of the coin there, right? Um, if you can build the same size structure but have less units, why should that why should that structure have less of a side uh, of a um, a setback? And I think with the conversation centered around the character of a neighborhood, well, the goals of this ordinance are to align the scale of triplex and fourplex with single family and duplex. Um, so while I say, you know, maybe the setback is not the biggest game changer, and I, and I think that's true, I think the question then should be, well, should we have a 10 foot setback for a single family home or duplex? Why the bias in our code toward single family home and duplex if it's the same size building? Um, and then on the ADU, um, Calculating uh, ADU as part of density, I think that's sort of um, outside of the scope of this ordinance. A uh, question from Commissioner George. Thank you, Assembly Member. I, pr I appreciate the feedback, and um, you know, it got me thinking about how in the S version. Uh, the small multifamily dwelling is removed from R3 and R4 because it, on the table, would mirror the multifamily dwelling requirement that's already in the table. So the 6,000 square foot minimum lot size, uh, the 50 foot width, and you know the five foot setback, it mirrors essentially what's already allowed there. So it really is redundant to have there. And it got me thinking, that's what's proposed for uh, R2M. So essentially the same thing in R2M and here we are reducing the minimum lot sizes and increasing the DUA, dwelling units per acre. Um, and it really gets me thinking, why do we have R2M and R3? Why isn't it all just R3? You know, if you can build the same thing on the same 6,000 square foot lot in both neighborhoods, what's the distinction? Um, and I think that's where the setback comes in because it, it, that is the characteristic of the neighborhood, really, is that what you can see from the street, um, not necessarily number of units. And I think that what we're trying to do is increase the number of units, not change the characteristic of neighborhoods. And I just want to leave it with that. I, can I respond to um, oh, Please. Yeah, I, I certainly appreciate that. Um, just to be clear, we are retaining the same front setback, so that 20 foot and the same rear setback of 10 feet. Um, and definitely open to the recommendations of the commission on the side setback. Um, in terms of R3 and R2M, R2M and R3 are both included in the compact mixed residential medium land use designation. Um, there is other assembly pending le legislation on consolidating some of those zones, right? Um, I think that one of the big differences between R2M and R3 is that already in code, if you have a lot size big enough, up to an eight plex is allowed in R2M. You can go beyond that in R3. Um, so uh, again, you, you'd, you'd have to have a lot big enough in R2M to create an eightplex, and we're certainly not saying that an eightplex should be able to be built on a 6,000 square foot lot. It's just that, that triplex and fourplex that so we can kind of consider small multifamily we think can fit into the scale of those established neighborhoods. Commissioner Gardner. Thank you. Um, going back, I guess, to Commissioner Eber's question about um, the timing and availability of, you know, additional um, public kind of processing and ability to respond to the newest version. And it, it was just thinking through what the process might look like. And I think your your answer suggested that maybe you were interested in speaking with co-sponsors about um, potentially providing additional time. And I'm just curious for what your thoughts would be that, um, well, first, I don't know how you know, likely you, you see that um, being as you stand here today. I, I gathered from your comment that you were interested in having discussion but not really wanting to commit to anything, which is fine. Um, but assuming you do go that way, 
do you see that then kind of coming back to us? And I'm wondering if it makes um, just what it would look like and, you know, so that we're not kind of ping-ponging back and forth in some fashion. And if, if you do see that as a likelihood, if it makes sense to kind of, uh, or, or maybe the question is what would be most useful for the assembly in terms of our fact-finding and review and comments um, if, if you're thinking that more time might be warranted? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so I think what myself and my co-sponsors would greatly appreciate is um, the commission's feedback on the S version now that you've seen it. Um, and I, I think we are pretty committed to, to that S version um, with the one amendment that was mentioned um, potentially on, on restoring the snow storage requirement for four units and up. Um, I, I think if, if we were to grant more time um, and to postpone on the 19th and maybe put it out to the first meeting in January, that would really be an effort to solicit further feedback from um, the community. And I think between your feedback on this S version and, and feedback on the, from the community, um, we could potentially make other necessary amendments reflective of that. And I will just say, um, as a policymaker, my perspective is, um, you know, it, it is certainly um, within normal, accept, uh, normal assembly practice not to have to publicly notice an S version. You can move it um, once the, the, the original version has been introduced. Um, and you don't also have to publicly notice in advance um, amendments. Now, the community doesn't always like that because there's changes that they may not have been aware of um, that impact them, potentially. Um, so I think that may, you know, a longer time frame may also allow, um, in addition to the public to be able to digest the S version, also for us to craft um, any other amendments that are reflective of your feedback or the feedback from the community. Thank you. I, I have a question. Um, most of the public testimony in opposition or cl com complaining or talking about time frame are from areas that they were worried that they were affected by this ordinance, but they mainly represent areas of town where R2M R3, R4 don't exist. What I didn't hear was testimony in opposition from Spinard Community Council, Turnigan Community Council, or South Edition, who tends to be very vocal. South Edition is affected by this, and you represent them. Do you have any feedback from, have you heard feedback from those areas, or do you know why none of them? And, and I guess also speaking to that, the S version seems a little more tame than the original. So I don't necessarily know that if we didn't get comment on the original version that the S version would draw out a bunch more comment. Um, so, but to back to my original question, do you know why those other communities aren't here? I did a presentation at the most recent South Edition Community Council meeting. Um, that was on Thursday night. Um, I will say there was mixed feedback. I think people do have concerns about this legislation in that neighborhood. Um, I heard concerns about parking. I had heard concerns about side setbacks, um, concerns about landscaping. I think there's also, I wanna say this delicately. I, th I think we have so many zones that it is sometimes difficult to know all the nuance, nuances of all the different zones. I think one of the most unfortunate things about R2M zoning is the two in R2M, because I think that some people think that two stands for duplex. And that is certainly not the case. You know, already in much of our R2 zoning, we have multifamily, we have townhomes, um, we have different types of housing and that's also what the 2040 land use plan calls for, um, is that sort of blend of, of housing needs. So I, I think having people um, 
be able to process our adopted plans and, and revisit those is important. Um, I know that the South Edition Community Council did introduce a, a resolution um, on this ordinance and plans, they're one of the community councils that their practice is you introduce it at one and you take it up at the subsequent meeting. So they'll be discussing this again in December and you know whatever the outcome of their um, deliberations is, you know whether they are for or against, I will plan to include that as part of the public record in our an assembly memorandum to go along with the ordinance. Um, you know, the co sponsors and I, we did a press release um, in around September when the ordinance was being introduced. Uh, we also did uh, an op ed in the ADN, purposefully soliciting feedback. Um, please email us. So we have tried to get the word out there to the community about these changes and our intentions behind them. Um, so I, I guess my hope is always that we will get. Um, input from the public. Commissioner George, back in there. All right, I, I promise last question for this presenter. I'm sorry for taking so much time tonight. Uh, it, it got me thinking a little bit about why we haven't had feedback, and I, and I appreciate um, all of your points. They're, they're excellent points. Um, you know, the R R2 is definitely a misnomer. Um, I, I think ultimately we want to see the density achieved that we've set out. And, you know, just one of the things that was helpful for me going through this was to create a chart of what's allowable now in R2M based on the lot size and what's proposed. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it, in a nutshell, it's plus two units, basically, at each of the size variations. They're pretty close, within, you know, 100 or 200 square, uh, square feet each time, but um, essentially you're going plus two units of what you could have done. Um, I think something as simple as that might be helpful. Um, I don't know that there's necessarily... Um, strong opposition to all of these items. I think um, when you start reducing like the setbacks, that, that for one, for me was a big one. Um, another, and this might be crossing over to something that you guys are gonna consider as the other body that we won't necessarily see, but the consideration of how um, the residential code versus the commercial code comes into play, sprinklering, that kind of thing, you know, uh, requirement like the state fire marshal office has jurisdiction to review fourplex plans but not triplex plans is my understanding from, they've got a letter here in the packet um, that they had objections to treating fourplexes the same as one, two, and three family dwellings. That uh, sounds like it's going to be something Title 23 that you guys will look at um, that we might not have a chance to weigh in on. But um, when you're talking about setbacks, part of that is safety. You know, we had a multi-fatality fire of a fourplex here in Anchorage less than a month ago um, in East Anchorage. And there is now a requirement that they be sprinklered for a reason. Uh, you know, there's emergency escapes on buildings in older cities for a reason. Um, so I think we should be careful wholesaling treating something that the state fire marshal office has statutory jurisdiction over and just changing that along with triplexes, which I think is maybe and I don't necessarily want to take the momentum out of, out of this proposal because I want to see both triplexes and fourplexes get built, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to just send triplexes ahead and hold on to fourplexes. Um, so I don't really know what the solution necessarily is, but maybe it's um, maintaining the setback uh, requirement for a fourplex at 10, but you know, five for a triplex. Um, I certainly would want to see um, a more favorable residential code for a triplex. Um, Maybe when you get to fourplex, maybe you don't have a choice because the state says you have to, to use that commercial code. I don't know. Um, but I hope that that's helpful feedback. I don't know that we'll have a chance to make um, these changes and vote on all these various items here tonight. So I think what I'll likely end up supporting uh, the amendment, uh, or the, excuse me, the ordinance and sending it forward, but with um, some of these thoughts in mind so that uh, the assembly can consider those. Um, if that's, of course, the will of the body. Um, I certainly don't want to see something like this derailed um, because we don't have enough public comments because I think that the opportunity has been there. I think it was sent out to the, through the Federation of Community Councils. I saw an email go out uh, a few weeks ago, so I know there's been distribution of it. Um, and uh, that's, that's my mm -hmm. remarks. Um, certainly, I know that my co-sponsors and I will value the recommendations that your commission makes. Um, on, the, so I appreciate you bringing up that 
that multiplex fire. And we actually emailed the fire inspectors after that happened, and we wanted to get more details. And that, that building was not sprinklered and was built in the 1970s. Um, our Title 23 ordinance, which is forthcoming and is being introduced on the addendum tomorrow evening, it does not remove sprinkler requirements for triplex and fourplex, but it does right size them. Um, essentially, the fire inspectors said, here's a less expensive type of sprinkling mechanism that we feel would be safe enough to use in small multifamily. Um, so I, I have really um, appreciated their input on, you know, one of the, the things that I've been saying is I don't want to throw the safety baby out with the overregulation bathwater. We have a question from staff. Uh, I was just going to clarify that the state fire marshal um, uh, does the inspections um, outside the municipal fire station. So if you're in Eagle River or Juyak or in Girdwood, then the inspection is for certain types of developments are uh, done by the state fire marshal. But um, uh, within the municipality, which is the focus, was where this ordinance would be in effect, um, it's, it'll always be um, municipal fire plan uh, review, fire prevention. And, um, and then they also do the pen and paper reviews for access outside of the municipal uh, fire service area. Thanks. I see no more activity in the queue. All right, thank you everybody. Now we will close the public hearing. What is the will of the body? Can I ask a question? Yes. What are we voting on? So we have the original, we have the S version with a couple criteria from the original, and then we have amendment one and we have amendment two. What is the process there? Um, I believe the S version okay. is what is intended to be moved forward. Then in the back of the S version, there's amendment one, which has basically been kind of canceled. Uh, amendment two reinstates snow storage, and that is suggested that we consider moving that forward. Um, there's also the comment from Chris Schutte and Cook Inlet Housing about a suggested amendment to Chapter 2 DCM to exclude three and four units. That would be a third thing to consider. My suggestion is maybe we do a main motion with some amendment motions so these can all be voted on separately. That would be my suggestion. Point of order, or procedural question, is what's noticed to the public, the case 127, the ordinance as introduced, and do we have to, I know the assembly can pull up an S version anytime they want. Can we substitute what's been publicly noticed and pass it forward, or do we have to work? It's, it's really no different than when we have a case and there might be a long list of staff recommendations and we move the staff recommendations. I, to me, I kind of see it similar to that. And that was the intent when staff began working with the assembly on the S version. So that, that would be my response. Um, Commissioner Krishna. Yeah, I also had a procedural question, which was just about, since this is essentially a recommendation to the assembly, if it would be more expeditious, essentially, to move our recommendations forward as findings rather than as amendments. Um, but I'm willing to hear whether that's not a good system. Uh, through, the, through the chair, um, 
Ms. Krishna, I think, uh, so tomorrow morning I'll write the resolution, which is the written form of your recommendation tonight. So you're gonna recommend, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, move to approve um, the S version um, in the affirmative and um, then decide if you uh, want to make any changes to it or recommend approval of it wholesale and then you'll make findings um, separate um, in support of that and you could make a finding at that point uh, about the DCM or whatnot uh, whatever you choose but I I don't think that there's the bill there'll be a, a difference between findings um, and recommendations I guess I'd just add that findings any of us could make a finding that doesn't necessarily mean the rest of us agreed or disagreed to the finding. So if we wanted to send a message that of what the commission thought as a whole, I think it should be done with a motion. Um, would you, Commissioner Krishna is ready to move. Would you like to state your motion? Sure, I'll get us rolling. I move in case 2023-0127 to recommend to the Anchorage Assembly approval of the proposed Assembly Ordinance 2023-103 S version for three and four unit development. Seconded by Commissioner Gardner. Ms. Krishna, would you like to speak to your motion? I would, um, and I, I do first have some comments to make about process. Um, you know, I'll, I'll push back, I guess, against uh, some of the comments and discussion we had here earlier and say that in my experience on this commission, this is a relatively high level of public participation. And I believe that we had um, many substantive comments during this process that help, will help us craft a recommendation that will have some um, effect, I hope. I also really want to thank staff for their work in bringing us um, a version that it, in, you know, my eyes is substantially improved from the one that we saw two weeks ago um, and much um, much closer to being something that we can recommend approval of and that we um, can believe will have minimal unintended impacts on code. So those are my initial um, comments and I welcome uh, amendments. Question? Um, so does this S version include the recommendations to not have the marine site included for this and, and those things from the first packet? Do those carry forward? Uh, through the chair, um, uh, Commissioner Polis, uh, the uh, Assembly's S version um, accepted uh, all of the recommendations that were in the staff um, report. Commissioner? Yeah, I suppose I would um, recommend one, or I would maybe ask for one amendment first, which is I think the biggest point of confusion right here is the table on page 15. And I think that um, the first amendment that would be helpful is clarifying that uh, this is the table we would like to recommend with the um, essentially folding in the small multifamily dwelling um, items, but just folding those into multifamily. Someone else can figure out how to word that. But my understanding is everything that's listed in this table as small multifamily, uh, as a permitted use, is intended by the assembly, but um, the small multifamily category itself is not meant to be moved forward. Mr. Chair. Yeah. I'm sorry, it was unclean because I uh, am speaking up, but I request to speak. Um, so, uh, Ms. Krishna, uh, I would ask uh, that you um, uh, withdraw the motion. Uh, let me explain. Um, if, if 
people look at the um, the the new the S version. Um, there are um, some weird things going on with the pages that um, I can uh, explain that'll make this cleaner. If everyone turns to page seven of your um, of your packet and look in the middle of page seven, uh, section three, it says in this new S version that the table of allowed uses is not amended. The table of allowed uses is not amended. Therefore, um, page 13, which um, page 13 that you did not um, want to be confused with this, and page 15 um, that um, as well, those both um, do not belong in this in this packet. Um, and uh, so, uh, you don't need to make that motion. There's just some things that are out of order. Um, the the department was uh, was sent um, page 15 and so we printed it you know on Friday afternoon and sent it to you um, and it's distributed here um, but that 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 page should be removed um, that's 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 just removed and then page 13 um, that um, is in the wrong order that um, should be behind Volen amendment one which um, um, Assembly Member Volen has stated that he does not want to uh, forward uh, at this meeting. Um, so, uh, what tables are being included? It's the one that was um, shared. Um, this this table, uh, the table of dimensional standards, is the only one um, that is, is it, it at issue with this S version. That's a very important clarification, and uh, I think my original motion should still stand since it didn't include that. Okay, we have a motion on the table. There's discussion around a couple amendments, but I don't see anybody jumping in. Or is anyone else wishing, I, I'm generally ready to support the motion, if that's the will of the body, or we can make some amendments. Commissioner Eber. Um, in general, I tend to support the motion as well. I think my only hold back, and it's not going to hold me back from voting either way is the setback. I'm not huge on changing it down to five, but I mean, that's just my recommendation. Uh, I guess I'll jump in and say, I, I've heard this setback thing quite a bit. Um, and I had a few things to say. Most of the lots we're talking about, uh, Assembly Member Volan made mention to some 3,000 lots. Most of these lots are 50 feet wide by 135 to 150 feet deep. Um, by having 10 foot setbacks for four units on that lot, you limit the building width to 30 feet. It seems impractical, uh, yeah, but you have a 20 foot front yard setback and a 10 foot rear yard setback and in theory you're probably going to have more than 10 feet from the rear yard because most of these lots have alleys, that's where your parking's going to go. So you're probably going to be taking 30 feet off the back, 20 feet off the front. So now you're getting down to a 70 by 30 building. I don't know that we, I think we've maybe taken the fourplex off the table at that point. And so for that reason, I would not support an amendment to the side yard setback. Um, as was stated several times, and I, I mentioned in the work session, I meet with people all the time and I tell them, well, you're a lot better off building a large duplex than four small units. And that kind of goes away from the intent of how this conversation got started, which was we need to get smaller units, different size units, and diversify the housing stock. So, I, 
I guess we're ready to call for the vote. Mr. Strike, how do you vote? We'll have to contemplation here, yes. That was a yes? Affirmative. Thank you. Motion passes. Okay. Mr. Chair, sorry about that, Francis. I no, it's okay. I'm confused. Um, did uh, did Commissioner Krishna make a motion and it was uh, seconded? Did you guys vote on that or you vote on the main motion? I'm confused. Main motion for the yes version, no amendments, approved. Thank you. And Jared, Jeff, and Scott's reappointments were confirmed by the assembly. Congratulations. Now we can hear a motion to adjourn. Do we have another meeting scheduled? <laughs>